Great, great. Well, we're a couple minutes past the 2.15 marker, so um, we'll go ahead and get started. Hi, everyone, and thank you so much for joining this session. My name is David Bond, and I'm a licensed clinical social worker, and I'm on the director for behavioral health at Blue Shield of California, and I'm very excited to be joined with, with Jeremiah for this talk. Jeremiah, I'll hand it to you for an intro. Thanks, David. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for being here with us on this Thursday afternoon. My name is Jeremiah Aha. I'm the Assistant Director with Wellness Together School Mental Health and the Blue Shield of California and Blue Sky Liaison. And um, reciprocate what you're saying, David, glad to be a part of this conversation. Also, a mental health clinician, have some uh, snapshots of hope to share um, with our attendees. I think that's welcomed during this last month of, of really a one-of-a-kind year. Yeah. Now, um, uh, of course, I think calling it a one-of-a-kind year is, is uh, sometimes the least you can say and the most you can say all at the same time. It's, um, I, I've lived in California, well, I've been in, in San Diego for about 15 years um, at various things throughout the county. And I, I can say, having lived in many other places, is that I'm, I'm, I'm really impressed in so many ways with how San Diego County has handled any number of things in, in this year. Um, I think there, there's always... Uh, there's always a portion to be improved upon, of course, but um, I, I think it's really a proud time to be living in California. Um, I, I want to um, sort of acknowledge, of course, and I think that you know everybody this late in the year, everybody has probably heard so many times just about, about how to acknowledge in group meetings and Zoom meetings all of the various complications of, of 2020. Um, so I, I, and there's nothing particularly novel even about going through a list of these things, um, but but I'm gonna. <laughs> um, so I, I think even as we talk about um, sort of a reawakening or, or the next great awakening in terms of understanding and learning more about uh, racial injustice to COVID and um, not just the disease, but also the shelter in place orders and, and all of the, um, the things that come along with it, whether it's new people working from home or our students having to go through school at home. Um, and, and then of course it would, it would be a, a huge miss to not talk about some of the stresses and pressures related to the presidential election, um, which has ended in relief for some and a great deal of frustration for others. Um, so the, the compounding of those um, really leads to, I think, um, what we talk about even kind of like compounding trauma that we're going through, um, not just as Californians or San Diegans, but at, you know, at a global level, which is, is a pretty new thing. Um, you can talk about like an acute stressor, which might be like one simple, like well, not simple, like but a, a one event that someone goes through on a day, like a car accident, for example. Um, but this this seems to be really just that compounded, complex exposure to trauma, um, where coping skills that used to work for us don't so much anymore. Or we really have to learn these modifications um, in dealing with you know, just some of these, these things that are now part of a new normal in some ways. Um, but I did want to talk a bit about what's going on for teenagers that we're seeing at, just as a, a third party payer for healthcare services. And some of the things from our data are about how young people are accessing mental health services. Before um, March, I can tell you that only about four to five percent of uh, the behavioral health or the therapy visits that we, we reimburse for happen through telehealth. Since March, there has been a huge explosion in the utilization of telebehavioral health services. Uh, I apologize, there's a, there's a truck in, in, outside my window, so I apologize for background noise. Um, this is also part of the new normal. Um, but, I'm sorry, so that huge, we went from about 4 or 5% of telebehavioral health utilization to closer to 75% of all of our, uh, tele, uh, of all of our therapy visits happened through telehealth. Um, and this is largely because um, at, toward the end of March, uh, the state allowed permission from Medi-Cal, and that my, my, I should have prefaced this before, um, at Blue Shield of California, I'm predominantly responsible for Medi-Cal in San Diego and Los Angeles County, um, and also Medicare, and then when you have both at the same time, some members have CalMedi Connect. Um, but what happened is the state allowed 
telephone only access to therapy appointments where before um, you had to use like a HIPAA compliant technology like a smartphone or a laptop um, or a tablet and since the end of March you can now a therapist can now be reimbursed for just using a telephone and none of those other platforms are necessary so it's particularly for the Medi-Cal um, population access became so much easier no longer did you have to drive or get a ride or take a bus to a therapy appointment, but you could actually just use a cell phone um, and you didn't have to have even internet access in your home. Um, so we, we found like that huge expansion has, has really been very impactful. Um, another another uh, thing that we've done that I, I want to really be able to hand this off to, to Jeremiah, who's going to be the expert in, in this field, uh, we wanted to really understand what is stressing out young people the most? What's, what's, what is happening with our students? What is it that, from their perspective, is the most impactful, um, the most, um, what are the things that are most complicated that they're dealing with? Uh, and so this wasn't just for California, it was from a national sample, but we really wanted to understand better um, without us making assumptions as even you know, as mental health providers or as parents or as you know, an insurance company. We want to see what can young people explain to us and help us to understand, and then what do they say and tell us that they need, and then how can we go about providing for that, um, really relinquishing the power <laughs> and intentionally saying, I want to um, really see through the lens of empowered young people what they're telling us that they want to look for. Um, and I say I, I mean we. I, <laughs> I, uh, I, I like to think that this was all my idea, but it really wasn't. It was much more, uh, Jeremiah is going to take us through this too, but um, so Blue Shield of California partnered uh, with an organization called Blue Sky to really respond uh, in many ways to those needs uh, and, and have additional things that we've been able to produce from that. So with that, um, I'd like to just pass it right back off to Jeremiah to take us through some of uh, what Blue Sky is intending to do and what we've learned. Thanks, David. I think uh, the, the two words that really stood out of what you just shared, I think it's a, an app description of this year, um, compound and complex, just all that we're facing. So I guess here's, here's the point in the talk where the presenters say, if you hear nothing else, hear this kind of thing. I would just share, hey, we're all feeling that and we're all not our A plus selves right now. That's okay. That's okay. So just offering space for us as professionals, just as human beings first, as San Diegans, just to say, hey, it's it's been a little bit tougher this year. And from a clinical perspective, you bet it is. I mean, there's lots of reasonable, understandable things to be you know anxious about, to be worried about. It's a lot that's happening. So um, that really popped off the page one when you said that, David, compound and complex. That's very, very true. So just a little bit of background before getting to some of the things that, that David had shared. Um, we're really excited, as I mentioned, I'm assistant director with uh, Wellness Together School Mental Health. Uh, we are a nonprofit here based in Sacramento, California. We actually have an office down in the Kern Mesa area, down in San Diego County as well. And we're one of the organizations, uh, actually the, the lead partner in the signature initiative that Blue Shield of California has launched last year called Blue Sky. And really our heart is to increase access increase awareness and increase mental health advocacy for our students and for our educators and for our families all throughout California. So we've uh, you know, been partnering with schools um, for the last um, several years um, from the you know, very top of the state all, all the way down to provide access to mental health services on campus and timely access too, which is couldn't be more important, um, especially this year by providing clinicians there on campus to work alongside the school staff or school counselors, school social workers, uh, principals, other administrators, or online, especially now, without any cost to the student or to their family, and without any eligibility requirements for insurance or for Medi-Cal and for, for things like that. It's been great to, to connect with Blue Shield just to understand and really see that their hearts um, were really all about where we were at. Obviously, they're a, a much bigger organization, right? But to, to uh, have a heart to increase access and really make it so that when our students are really you know, seeing a need, that they need extra support, that they can get it right away. And so we've had the, the privilege of being in 20 schools 
Um, about half of those down in San Diego County here with you all, and about half of those in the East Bay in, in Alameda County. They're partnering again with those schools to provide mental health clinicians right on campus to help students that are in need. Now, I have this behind me just to show the other partner organizations that have been a part of this. You're going to hear about this one over here in the lower right, do something.org, um, but also just really glad to partner with Youth Mental Health First Aid, which is uh, training essentially a mental health 101 is a way to identify signs in our young people that they might be struggling. So for you know, non clinicians, non mental health practitioners, you know, like teachers or bus drivers or admin support, so they can understand and see when a student's really struggling, how to best connect them to those vital resources in a timely fashion. Also that the California Department of Education, they've been a great partner throughout this whole process, as well as directing change, which provides you know, suicide prevention curriculum, as well as a film contest that happens every year. It's really cool. We invite you to check that out. We have like a red carpet ceremony. And even this year, because it was unhealthy into the school year in June of 2020, they um, really did an outstanding job, just literally kind of rolling out the red carpet for these students as they're creating videos to help reduce stigma, to help raise mental health awareness. And so with Blue Sky, we um, were able to partner with, with DoSomething.org, and they released something last year, I'm going to bring this up on the screen again, called the New State of Mind. And it was a guy that really gathered students online, and there was actually about 48,000 students that signed up to be a part of this. Do something.org is an organization that gathers students and online platforms to organize, to empower, and to really compel them to participate in offline action. So not just staying in the social media space, but really to a place to, to advocate for them, to do no, uh, initiative there on their campus to raise some mental health awareness and advocacy. And so as a part of that, students would go and sign up. They had a chance to even win a scholarship for their participation in the New State of Mind campaign. That 48,000 of them uh, submitted uh, tips. And actually, there was a total of 75,000 tips submitted on social media as some of the things that are their biggest stresses right now, some of the things that really help them, some self-care strategies. And really, just from a clinician's perspective, David and I are really excited because we can see that our students more and more are talking about these things. They're really connecting on these things. And from an anecdotal perspective, it really is showing signs of the stigma around mental health for our students to be decreasing, that it's becoming more and more okay to say, hey, I need some extra support. And maybe even you, know, you or your colleagues or your family have had the opportunity to realize that because, uh, I mean, <laughs> For the overachievers among us, uh, perfectionism and the pandemic don't mix very well. That's a recipe for, for disappointments and for some sadness, and it can be really difficult. And so our students are, are you know, having more conversations around mental health and around uh, you know, wanting to seek out support. So some of the things to kind of connect the dot that, that David was sharing is we found in a lot of these, these forms that they were submitting and these questions that they were answering, and you know, Instagram or Twitter, these social media platforms is that um, anxiety had increased for them, that they were worried. And, and who wouldn't be, right? I mean, can we all admit that life was hard enough before the pandemic? Like it was already hard, right? Maybe not all the time, but it was definitely difficult before these things came in. And so now we, we think about, you know, as we step into the shoes of, of these homes, you know, particularly, you know, here in California, and just think, you know, that their, their parents, you know, hours may have been cut if they were able to keep their job. Maybe the housing and the security of, of a stable home environment was put into jeopardy. Um, we've had, you know, this isn't um, the best and most hopeful anecdote to share, but even some of our clinicians are working with students that have had multiple family members um, die as a result of the virus. These are some of the, the worst fears, particularly around, you know, an adolescent where they're still understanding how to identify and to regulate and really to control these emotions. They're hit with some, some very scary things. And so we're seeing that with these programs like the New State of Mind campaign to sharing like, I feel really anxious. You know, my chest is hurting. It's, it's tough to fall asleep. You know, these kinds of things. Others could be saying, you know, this distance learning, this is really, really tough. Hey, I, I could, I was nailing it on campus. This is really hard to keep all this straight. 
which is completely understandable, right? Because it's put more of the responsibility on our students to you know, uh, produce their own kind of structure and predictability when it can be pretty tough when a school day means waking up, opening the laptop at the kitchen counter, right? And so there's there's more even kind of this you know pressure to achieve or to maybe meet at the same level they were you know meeting academically before the pandemic, and so they're feeling anxious around school or, or anxious around what's going on within the environment. Um, but I'll also share that again. I think the flip side of this, the 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 light side, is to see that we're finding our students are more and more having these conversations, and it's it's allowing their friends to be able to say, hey, you know what, I'm in the same. I'm in the same place. This is what's happening with me as well, and it's really a means of, of validating kind of kind of where where they might be at. Last, I just want to highlight on this slide as well this new state of mind campaign. I thought it was it was really really powerful, and that is almost nine out of ten of these students said that they are more likely to advocate for mental health resources at their school site after the campaign. So what this is telling us is with with something like this, with the efforts. And really the commitment of the Blue Sky Initiative is that students are saying, hey, we need these more, more of these supports at school. Before the pandemic, they spend a majority of their time there at school, right? And so what that means is, hey, we, we want a place to be able to go to for support in addition to you know, school counselors, again, school psychologists, you know, principals, all those that are there. And we work alongside, you know, wellness together, our clinicians work alongside those really to add you know, supplemental mental health resources for that to happen. And so we're finding that, that that's been also a good thing to say that students are saying, hey, we, we need a little bit more of this and that we're kind of putting their, their voice out there for that. Just lastly, just to share just a, a three kind of coping strategies or, or three ways that, that we've seen in many of our presentations as also um, we've, we've increased quite a bit of our wellness education virtual presentations. And a, a big shout out to Chantel Irvin on the Wellness Together team. She's our, our program manager. She's actually on helping to field any questions you might have. So please submit those in the chat stream. She is there monitoring that. But um, Chantel and I work closely together, kind of directing and leading the Blue Sky team of clinicians. And it's been really great. And one of the things in the summer that they developed was these wellness education presentations that can be delivered virtually um, to classrooms and to, to students and families. And so I, I kind of pulled from that, just some of the content that's there that seemed to be really effective. We're hearing some good feedback on that. So I, I wanna share three of those with you after just another snapshot of hope, just some good news here. And that's this, 2019, at the end of the, the first semester, you know, at the end of December 31st, 2019, there was nearly 1,300 uh, therapy sessions that students participated in, whether they were individual or group sessions or crisis intervention or family engagement sessions. 1,300 sessions were provided to students that maybe wouldn't have otherwise been able to access these services in a timely fashion. Well, it's it's really interesting to compare those numbers from last year to this year and kind of what, what's happening and how COVID-19 has imp impacted that. And if our, our efforts to increase access really has been something that's been timely and relevant, especially as we've already said in a year like none other. Well, I'm very proud to say that as of even today, as um, Chantel has created kind of a, a real-time Blue Sky program data dashboard, we are um, over 1,100 sessions as of today, December 3rd. So pretty close to on track of where we'll be, even in the midst of the complications and the challenges um, the, the digital divide, that maybe the lack of access to these devices or to Wi-Fi, but students are still finding ways to connect. They're, they're still building trust. They're still participating in the Wellness Together program there on campus. So I'm very pleased to share with you in the midst of maybe the complications and, you know, David, as you shared, you know, as us, you know, the, you know, for me on Fridays, it's like, that it seems like the lawnmower just has to go right outside the, the bedroom door whenever you know, a meeting is happening. like In the midst of all these things that are kind of frustrating, just know that there are programs, there are efforts, and likely many that you are a part of as well, that we, we are really meeting students in the community where they're at and providing some support that is so desperately needed. And I'm just really excited to be, to be a part of that. Um, David, just to check in with you, because I've just been you know 
rambling on for a while before I go to our coping strategies. <laughs> anything that you would add or anything just to supplement before kind of going into um, those strategies for everyone? Well, you know, it's um, I, I appreciate you front loading me there too, because as you were talking, I was like, oh, I'm going to, when it's my turn again, I'm going to alter the way that I start. <laughs> um, but I, I would, I would jump in on that one too, and that um, it, what we found, all right, so I'll go back to young people spend about $168 billion in a year on wellness. And so, and this is mostly millennial spending. Um, so it's a bit older than high school age students now, but we can see how this is going to trend and continue to evolve. But it, it's really about a completely different approach to wellness and health. Where if you talk to someone like a, like a Gen Xer or a boomer, um, we can talk to you about our doctor and what we do or don't. I mean, we have relationships with our doctors. We find now, though, that only 60, 60, like, 8% of millennials have a relationship with their primary care physician. There's a, a need for um, why should I wait for two weeks to get in an appointment when I can just go to urgent care right now, or better yet, I can go on, um, uh, you know, any, I can Google any website. In fact, it probably won't even be Googling a website. It'll probably be a YouTube search for and talk about my symptoms and I'll diagnose myself and I'll decide whether or not I want to go see a healthcare practitioner. But what I, what I meant to say too is that when we're talking about coping skills, um, it, it's one thing to know and be able to, and have the metacognition to know I'm going through it right now. I need to stop what I'm doing and engage in one of these coping skills and make that like an innate behavior or an innate like uh, initial thought that someone has. I, I think really rather than um, focusing on like single coping skills, as I, I'm sure that, that, that you would agree, it's really about having an entire buffet of options to choose from. Um, and then as kind of what I was saying before too, is that during COVID or during shelter in place, that buffet is a lot smaller um, because you don't necessarily have access to the same things that we had before, but it exists nonetheless. So I think really when I was talking before about all this, all the, the search for wellness and health, it's really about lifestyle choices. Um, and I think, you know, that we'll, we'll call millennials are like the self-help generation and, and it has to do with the reduction in stigma like you talked about. But it's sort of a thing where, uh, where you step back and say, this is what my life trajectory is looking like and what do I need to do in terms of lifestyle changes or healthy choices uh, in one way or another? And what am I doing that's helping me feel better? And what am I helping, what am I doing that's helping me feel worse? Um, it, 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 while, the, while acute um, coping strategies are absolutely effective, it's the decision to make them a part of an ongoing lifestyle. Very good. So it's integrated within all the day to day. It isn't self help is something that is like a supplement, or self care isn't something that's extra, but rather when that becomes kind of a, a filter by which we're making decisions. Hey, is is four more episodes of the show really worth how I'm going to feel the next day? You know, sleep hygiene has been a big one for young people. To your point, David, as you know, in March. We saw quite a bit of, um, you know, still really heavy participation within students that have referred to the Wellness Together program. In fact, 75 to 90 percent of those students that have been referred to be a part of the one-on-one -on -one, uh, Wellness Together program to receive, you know, cognitive behavior therapy once a week there at school, they were still engaged. They were still connecting. And what we've seen, again, I acknowledge from kind of a, our uh, subjective kind of, you know, anecdotal perspective is students had you know, some sleep hygiene, they had some structure, they had some predictability. And then when the, you know, when the school shutdowns and, and kind of the, the pandemic hits and that very day-to-day -day reality, then we began to see there were complications at that point. But you know, some of these students in March and April were like, school's out, it's summertime, that's it. And so you've had you know, some students, whether it be for six weeks during the summer or some for six months, that have really just kind of, you know, um, participated, whether it be, you know, in coping skills such as, you know, screen time or substances or other relationships or just really that lack of that structure that, that the school environment provides for our young people. Now them being engaged is pretty tough. And that's one thing we really advocate for in the classroom in these wellness education presentations is sleep hygiene and digital hygiene. And there's ways to connect online for sure. TikTok is fun, I acknowledge it, uh, but we have an asynchronous one-on-one -on -one type of environment. What we know with our mental health is that it is a, a great contributor to positive mental health and positive well-being to spend time 
in a real-time environment with a, not one, but maybe even a small group of people, um, whether it be, you know, in some of the, the Zooms that we have and the hours of happiness, I'll call it, on the Friday afternoon with your colleagues, right? It's life-giving for us, um, as, as some might say, right? And so that sleep hygiene, that digital hygiene, that, that being outdoors, whenever the air quality is okay, that can be super helpful. Another thing too, just to, um, I guess, to explain that it's been really exciting kind of before going into these coping strategies. And I acknowledge that I'm building way more intrigue than probably necessary. So it isn't, I'm not trying to get your hopes up. I think there's just some good things to share what we've seen. We've been able to increase the caseloads that our clinicians have been able to see students up to 25%. So now because of you know, less transition time, for example, um, you know, our mental health specialists is what we call them, they aren't having to walk down to you know, the uh, you know, Algebra two classroom you know, to get the student. They aren't having to write passes, they aren't having to you know, have the phone to call the classic phone in the classroom to bring down the students. So there's less transition time. So that means there's more time for our clinicians to meet with students. So we've been able to increase caseloads and that's been one of the ways We've been able to just with the heart of Blue Sky to increase access every angle that we can between you know in a one-on-one -on -one environment or even these wellness education presentations. But with with these coping strategies, I think it's good to acknowledge too that adults and students, or actually adults in particular, we're the the pilot and the passenger in this pandemic. Like we're we're trying our best if you're a caregiver or a family member and. You know, there's a young person who looks up to you to help make those decisions. You're trying to navigate these turbulent skies as the pilot, but unless we're over a hundred years old, which would be very impressive if someone was on right now, this is your first global pandemic that you've navigated, right? And so we're also passengers just going like, how is this gonna go? And so it is, you know, particularly stressful and there is some kind of, you know, high tension and maybe this does give language to maybe how, whether it be you or others in your home have been, you know, maybe a little more irritable or maybe had more kind of what we call psychosomatic symptoms, maybe headaches or stomach aches or kind of pains in your chest. Uh, maybe this gives language to, you know, man, I've been so tired like these past few months. This is our body's way of trying to, to cope with all this. So one of the ways that, that we can really help navigate this, and this not only goes for you or for the young people that you work with or even for kids of your own, and if you haven't, you know, already kind of integrated this, as David said, made this a part of your, your everyday lifestyle, is to implement as much predictability and structure as you can, because those are gonna be some prized commodities during this time, predictability and structure. So it could look like, um, you know, you're having set bedtimes, set wake up times for the, you know, a little bit easier when we have younger kids. Maybe it's, you know, it's very easy right now, right, to, to go from, you know, conference to conference, from Zoom meeting to Zoom meeting, and where we eat dinner is the same place where we spent the last nine and a half hours. Try and have place, I think David's modeling this really well. Looks like he's at his workstation, right? Well, I don't know, David, maybe you eat dinner there? I don't think so, though. <laughs> no, I, I, I would ask, though, Jeremy, too, uh, you're talking about as as your clinician's ability to have higher caseload increases of you already I know you know where I'm going with this one too then the need to take care of the clinicians increases as well right I think when when I first started as a therapist I had a required caseload of like 25 and I was working in a clinic at the time in, a, um, in another hospital um, over the next seven years my in order to meet that um, that no, no, a quote is not the right word, but the, the, the uh, productivity standard, I then needed to have 32 hours of therapy in a week, even though research was really showing that 25 is really where a therapist meets their capacity for being effective. And mm -hmm. over 25 can really impair the effectiveness, um, not just because, well, one, because you're less capable of being emotionally available for more than 25 people in such an intense way for that long. And so now when you're talking about they no longer have to go to the Algebra 2 class to get the kid out of class to bring them back, or the student, excuse me, back to get them out of class, I'm sitting here thinking, well, I spend most of my day at this desk looking at this screen, and I actually am more productive and do more because I'm in these back-to-back -back meetings, but I don't get to get up and walk to the next meeting or have you know, people that aren't, don't shuffle in. 
it's all this sort of digital exposure. And something that you said earlier that made me really, um, that popped into mind too, is that everybody has some need for social interaction. Even introverted, even intensely introverted people have some need for social interaction. And there's a synthetic social interaction that happens from Instagram and TikTok and, and where you're following and tracking people that you've never met. And so you can lose two hours in TikTok thinking that you're engaging in social interaction because maybe you even post your own material and you're liking other people's stuff. But when you put it down, the thing that keeps you from being lonely has not been activated. So it's like that synthetic, like I think I'm interacting with other people, but it only maybe adds a small percentage of your genuine need to interact with other people. So it's that, it's that again, another need for workaround to figure out what can I do with a mask on with another human being. Yes, 100%. I, I like how synthetic that you mentioned that. It's as if for a diet, all you did was take supplements and vitamins. It can be helpful to a point, but it's not going to get just the, I mean, even the interaction of all the you know, vitamins and minerals that you need for you know, a physically healthy lifestyle. I, it's almost as if you, uh, we pre-planned this and we totally didn't. I'm very glad to say that um, 24 hours is a, a full time for our clinicians on the campus. Because even as you mentioned, you know, you're working with the students that are um, in the most significant need, you know, sometimes in their entire life. And those are they're very heavy things. And as you know, one of the um, trauma-informed scholars, and Dr. Charles Figley, has said, uh, caring has a cost. There's a cost to this. And so we want to make sure we're taking care of our clinicians. Additionally, again, totally unplanned, uh, but today, Chantel actually um, led a group Zoom. We have you know, regular group Zoom trainings. And today for our clinicians was um, self-care strategies. Really as a reminder, again, are we doing these? This is kind of during the holidays time. It can be pretty hectic. And the next thing I'll share too, and this can be for everyone, Chantel, if, if you wouldn't mind putting this in the chat, um, if you're able to, to put to everyone in there, but that is um, we are you know, partners with uh, UCLA, USC, University of Maryland have come together to create statprogram.org, S-T-A-T, Support for Teachers Affected by Trauma. Statprogram.org is the link to go to. You don't necessarily have to be a teacher to, um, to participate in this, but it's free. It's about 90 minutes. It's about, it has a great kind of evaluation tool to see how am I being affected, maybe from the difficulties in life that are around me, which at some level we are all experiencing. That's something all our clinicians have gone through and we always advocate. So if you're in the you know, mental health space or working with others where maybe you can, air quotes, go home, kind of with, with a heavy burden, that's definitely a, a free place that I would check out just to take care of yourself. Um, but thank you, David, that, that's good stuff. I think um, one another strategy again that, that you had shared is yes, even for the intensely introverted people, we have a deep need to connect with others. In fact, the depth and breadth of our relationships is the number one predictor to a happy and healthy life. Uh, there's a small school in the Northeast called Harvard, and they've been doing a study for like over 80 years. And they found that relationships really is the key for, for having a, a you know, positive well being and for you know, increasing resilience. So, in this age, especially now, I'll encourage you and you know, the young ones that may be a part of, of your family or those that you're helping support is to whatever the family has decided is safe and healthy for them in terms of their own boundaries on connecting with others, to connect on a regular basis with with other people. It could look like, you know, on, on WhatsApp or on Zoom or FaceTime or having, you know, I think even Disney Plus and, and Hulu, you know, all kind of the major platforms, they have ways to kind of have air quotes movie nights all in our individual living rooms. And David, to your point, yes, these are never going to replace like the real thing, but maybe it can be okay if all the parties involved have deemed it safe and healthy to you know, go into a backyard, maybe, maybe a friend has a projector to watch a movie together, do what you can and whatever you've deemed safe and healthy, that's totally up to you and your family um, to connect on a regular basis. That is so, so important. The last thing is this, and this is a fun exercise, and then David, I'll toss it to you because I think we have a, some, a great um, parent mental health survey to tell our attendees about. The last one is this, it's impossible, it's impossible to be anxious 
and grateful at the same time. It's impossible to be anxious and grateful at the same time. And the reason why, from a clinical perspective, is that anxiety is always about the future and the fears that come from that imagined future. What if they don't say this? What if, what if they thought I meant this in this email? What if they don't call back? What if you know, he didn't like that? It's all these what-if scenarios. Well, gratitude is about the present. And so not just even beyond just gratitude lists, those, those can be great, but having a, a kind of an outlook that sees this is what's in front of me. This is what is here where I am present. This is what I can be thankful for. That can help mitigate some of these effects that anxiety, these unhelpful you know, effects that can have on us. So it may look like for you to begin doing a daily practice of gratitude of three to five specific things with no repeats um, that, that you're grateful for. Maybe it happens with you know, those you live with, whatever it might be, gratitude can be just an excellent mitigator of some of these effects of anxiety. And we have some really um, positive news from this mental health survey. David, I'll, I'll turn it over to you to share a little bit about that with our attendees. Great, thanks, Jeremiah. Um, and as you're um, as you were talking, I, particularly about gratitude, I was thinking. Um, oftentimes, people will ask me about like, well, I don't really feel like going to therapy or doing these other things. Is there a book I can read? Um, and I, I just want to just, I have no disclosures to make. I'm not making any money from this. But mm -hmm. if you're like, uh, I just need kind of a feel good moment, watch Brene Brown's Netflix special. Um, mm -hmm. She's she's fabulous. Uh, um, she's a shame researcher. And if you if you're interested, my my number one book recommendation, especially now and for parents and for people working with children, is a Brene Brown book called The Gifts of Imperfection. And I think it's like at least ten years old, but um, it's, it's just fantastic. If you if you read one, I don't even want to call it a self help book, but I'm like if you're even if you're not a self help person and you read one. Brene Brown book, <laughs> um, The Gifts of Imperfection is a really good place to start. She has another one for um, uh, in the workplace about having to do with leadership. She has lots of books. I mean, she doesn't give me any money for, for recommending her. Just wanted to put that one out. There. Um, um, but I did want to I, I did want to say too, um, meeting young people where they are is pretty complicated. Even though we've all had an experience, even adults have been there before we haven't been there before this year and it, you know having you know i'm at the tail end of gen x so i'm the first generation to have video games in my living room and the last generation to spend most of my time playing outside um so uh but i don't have an experience of being a millennial child and i don't have experience of being a gen z child either so uh so i only see things through my own de developmental lens but my um I make a joke sometimes. <laughs> or I'll, uh, let me. All right, I'm gonna. Summer, I'm gonna get to the end of the story. So I uh, was once coming. This is before COVID, and I flew home from. It doesn't really matter where. And I got into my Lyft that I had ordered. Um, and I think I'm. You know, like I'm. You know, I use Uber and Lyft. And uh, so I get in the car, and there's a millennial driver, and um, he couldn't get his the gear. He has an automatic gear shift, but he couldn't get it to move. It was locked in place, and I had never experienced that problem before. And I'm sitting here thinking, this is going to take forever. No one knows how to fix a car. This is going to be trash. And I'm thinking, like, my problem solving, I'm like, I, I have to get out of this car. Cancel it. I'm going to get out of the car. I'm going to get a different car. That's how I would cancel it. That's how I fix my problem. But I'm not going to fix this guy's problem, right? So my first thought is, if I were the driver, how would I go about fixing this problem? Well, I probably would call someone to, like, someone who knew something, somebody that I knew, though. I'm thinking, well, my uncle might know something about cars. My big brother might know something about cars. I'm going to call one of them because they're people that I know for how to help me solve the problem. And if they are not going to be able to help me, then I'm going to have to call some professional, I don't know, like to tow the car or something like that because I don't know how to get this, out, this gear out. So he opens up his phone, and I'm like, who is he going to call? No, he goes straight to YouTube. He doesn't Google it. He goes, and I'm not getting money from Google or YouTube either, but he goes straight to YouTube, and he searches – I don't know, something like, how do I get my gear out of locked on my Toyota? And I'm, he crowdsourced his problem solving. He, and, it, and, you know, then he's got like the top hits for people that have posted being in this, how to fix that situation from around the world. He just crowdsourced how to get out of what he was going through. He goes right to like the first top video that shows him exactly what he needs to do. Within a couple of minutes, he did the thing that the video showed him how to do and he shipped it and, we, and off we were. And I'm sitting here thinking, this is like a millennial skill set. I mean, I definitely, like, not that I could not have done the exact same thing, but I was like, his instinct was to crowdsource the solution to his problem. So uh, where it would not have been my first instinct. Um, and this is, it's the same thing with 
how to seek health care, where my first call would be, well, maybe I should make an appointment with my doctor. Meanwhile, my partner, who is a millennial, says, well, why should we do that when you know you can just walk right into urgent care? I ended up calling my doctor. Anyway, but, but the point I wanted to do was, as the healthcare industry, we have to continue to meet new patients and new um, consumers or people who need healthcare in their language and where they are with the way that they're most likely to want to pro, um, pursue healthcare. Um, so I, I think really that was that was quite a bit of the inspiration behind our partnership with Blue Sky as well, and and making sure that we're providing digital platforms which are much more likely to be consumed by young people. But still, no matter how you're serving young people, particularly like young people who are minors, children living with their parents, come to think of it, now it's 2020. I mean, anybody under 26 still <laughs> maybe living with their parents um, or, or even older at this point, I suppose. Um, but if you're, not, if you're not offering assistance to the parents and caregivers, you're really offering limited assistance to the young people in those households. Um, mom's alcohol problem is going to be 14-year-old's probably number one stressor uh, and number one thing contributing to that person's mental health. So if we don't also offer um, substance misuse opportunities uh, or opportunities for healing from that or, or coping or working around to the parents, we're really only helping to patch up some things. And we don't want to be those folks who say, just hang on tight till you're 18 because then you can move out and be away from the situation. That's, that's not what a 14 year old needs to hear. Um, so we knew then partnered with this survey for young people. This is a long-winded way to get to it, I'm sorry. Uh, part, in, in order to partner with this survey for how to help young people, we said, well, we have to do the same thing for parents uh, and, and the adults who, who are responsible for giving care uh, in the same way. So we engaged in another survey with Finn, uh, which was the organization, um, which was the, the, the parent, actually, I wanna make sure I get this, this title completely accurate. Um, but it, it basically it was a survey for, for parents uh, of children. We surveyed almost a thousand parents of a child, at least one child under the age of 18. And we found some things that we expected to find, but some numbers that we didn't really expect to find. And the first one I wanted to make sure to touch on was that 67% of the parents that we surveyed uh, discussed their child's mental health and well being with their child at least once a month. And I think at first I thought, well, duh, right? Because just checking and saying how, hey, like this has been a really rough year. How are things going with you? That's checking in on your child's mental health. Um, but what we're realizing is this is happening much more frequently. And I think that the reason that it's happening is because of the reduction in stigma around talking about mental health that we're teaching up as well. So young people, you can see it all in television shows um, and in the songs that are being written. You know, Sean Mendez is this huge hit now. His first album was largely about the, the anxiety that he experiences, which young people really can connect with. Um, not that older people don't have anxiety too, but young people are much more likely to talk about it. And it's kind of like, um, there's almost, I heard one young person say like, there's a, he was a comedian, but he was talking about, you know, we we have we experience mental health and mental health challenges in such a way that we almost brag about them like oh you just have major depressive disorder that's nothing i have major depressive disorder and adhd and generalized anxiety disorder it's almost like a stack not not a status thing necessarily but um, that and that person had to use some comedy to be able to address the the frustrations of those mental health challenges which i believe is healthy um <laughs> sorry but i was kind of going in a loop with this one um when I was a child, nobody wore seatbelts. It wasn't required, and our parents didn't wear, wear, wear seatbelts. Nobody wore seatbelts. Um, in, in time when I was a young, you know, when I was in kindergarten or young grade school. But when I was in second grade, the U.S. government engaged in a public health approach to teach second graders about seatbelt safety and basically taught us how to shame our parents into using their seatbelts. And then the, the, because I, I think that what happened was there was a, an adult learning situation. They're like, we're never going to teach people over a certain age and get them to change their behaviors to wear their seatbelts unless the pressure is coming from within the family. So we, we blanketed grade schoolers with put on your seatbelt every time you get in the car and make your parents put on their seatbelts. And now everybody wears seatbelts. And death by motor vehicle accident has dropped dramatically in the last 30 years. 
dramatically. Um, so such as the same that we're destigmatizing mental health by enabling young people and empowering young people to address mental health and to address stigma and bring it back into the households and teach up. And now we have parents, um, uh, largely millennial parents, who are, um, and, and boomers actually, who have a, a much more comfort in talking about mental health than you would guess, I think. I would really encourage every, anybody, um, anybody in this session to go to Blue Sky dot blueshieldca.com where we've got all of these repo reports and, and surveys posted as well as tips for parents and educators and children um, or young people I should say um, so Chantal if you could put that in the in the chat um, I, that would be really helpful I think uh, to, to share with everyone it's blue sky dot blue shield ca dot com um, it's, it's a beautiful website too. So um, with that one, I want to kind of pass it back over to Jeremiah to, to hit on this next point as well. Yeah, thank you. That is that is great. I, I like the lift story. That's that's super interesting and just kind of his uh, your driver's first approach to kind of solving that and, and where that goes. And then kind of as a call back to what you said at the very beginning, more and more our students are even looking at that for kind of addressing uh, their mental health. Right? So the, the second big finding that stood out in this survey, it's actually just released today. You can find it on that website. Chantel, thank you for putting that there in the chat for our attendees um, to check out the results. But uh, one in three parents said the mental health of their child is stressful to them. I just want to repeat that again. One in three parents said the mental health of their child is stressful to them. So a, a few things we can take from that. Number one, that um, wow, that's you know a third of parents are really, you know, um, you know worried and, and concerned where they're at. But two, I wonder how many of those parents, for the first time, for the very first time in that child's life, is now paying attention to some of the things that they're saying, some of the ways that they're behaving. You know, maybe it's not just dismissive. Oh, they're always tired. They're just going to sleep in. But maybe this could be more symptomatic of some other things that are going on. Right. Um, I also see that one in three. The story behind those numbers is a way that the parents are are noticing and are um, able to connect and have those conversations, David, as you had mentioned, you know, with, with their child, even for themselves too. As I think it's so important um, to lead with with empathy and with understanding, kind of where where their their child may be at. And so, with with this one in three, um, there's definitely quite a few um, ways that that. Um, parents are able to, to get quick access. Obviously, I'm going to root um, for, for Blue Shield members uh, for there to get some timely access there and the telehealth numbers that have dramatically risen. You know, if uh, in San Diego County and maybe some of the, the students you're providing care for and you know, go to one of the, the schools, one of the 20 schools in East Bay or San Diego County, I mean, the average wait time is, is two days from referral to a student. Oftentimes, with, with now with telehealth, it's even the same day. And even some of those community providers. So I would also share if at any point that you feel that um, you or you know those that you help support that your your child or the, or the person that kind of looks up to you for their own care is maybe in danger of themselves or others, asking them, are you considering taking your own life? That is not suggesting to them an option. Just to get that myth out there, that doesn't tell them. You know, this is you know a viable means of, of kind of solving the problems they're going through. Asking that kind of question and asking these open-ended questions to hear what their students or you know what their young person is saying really communicates to them. This is a place where I can hear what you are saying, but the most important part is to listen non-judgmentally after asking those questions. So if there is a concern that you know, it could be some really some, some needs here that you know, maybe outside of my own scope, ask them, encourage the families that you're with to talk to their child. You know, I've noticed, uh, you know, this year has been really hard. I noticed you haven't been yourself lately. And just stopping and hearing what they're saying. And just, and don't try and solve anything. Don't try and fix anything. We're so quick to fix, we, you know, especially in a year like this, it's so much more important just to be heard, just to have someone to be with them. And so, you know, and if it goes to a place of danger, you know, there's an emergency room, there's, you know, access to a mental health clinician if, if those are there in your area. Um, even um, calling, you know, the, the California Youth Crisis 
hotline 24 hours in Spanish and English, we partner with them. The crisis text line 741-741. There are resources out there for them. So these numbers, what I am glad to hear for David and I are presenting us is that these conversations are happening more and more. And it's up to us as, as supporters of these families really to make it the least amount of friction so we can best support them in their time of need. Um, I think that kind of wraps it up, David, before we kind of go to some questions, definitely open to hearing if you want to kind of put, uh, you know, capstone on anything, but I wanted to leave some time for people to, to ask anything else. Uh, oh, and, and I, I appreciate the handoff too. And um, it, it, it's interesting, especially what you were saying about um, people thinking of suicide. Uh, we know that risk for suicide has been really, uh, risk, risk for suicide attempt has been really increased with all the additional those compounding stressors that we talked about. Um, so I, I would say, uh, I would completely echo, and you're absolutely right, and you're right on with the research that says asking someone if they're thinking about killing themselves does not increase their risk. Um, it, it does not introduce a new thought that they weren't thinking about before. It, it's introducing an opportunity to discuss what's really going on uh, in a genuine way. So I, I think, you know, before we talked about, um, for parents, especially that ability, um, exactly what you were talking about is to open that conversation up and be, you know, in terms of, you know, it's been really complicated. It's even been hard for, you know, for, for me. I just wanted to check in, see how you were doing. You know, how are you, how are you getting through it? And the secret is, stop talking after you give the prompt. <laughs> it's so easy as a, as a teacher or a parent or an adult to, if the young person doesn't begin speaking right away, start offering multiple choice opportunities for a response. Like, is it this? Or is it maybe this? Or was it what your grandma said last week? And really, you're just projecting your own stuff when you do that. Um, when you do those guessing. So it's, it's offering up the opportunity. Sometimes, you know, make an observation about what you see. You know, I noticed that you haven't really been um, hanging out with your buddy, Kirk. I just made that name up. <laughs> I don't even know a Kirk. Uh, I, I noticed that you haven't been hanging out with your best friend and just wanted to check in to see what's going on um, or how things are going um, and then stop talking. And for young children, it's not always about the, the dyadic conversation. It's about play and, and really spending time with a young child especially, you know, like under 12, especially and, 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 and beyond, um, is scheduling playtime with creative play. Um, so yeah, I mean, play games with rules, great. Play video games with your kids, great. But creative play is really when you're engaging with toys um, and there's like storyline play or there, there's something that is going on and really allow the child to lead the play because children express everything that they have observed or that they're thinking about or concerned about, um, things that they're scared of. That's what, that's what feeds imagination and that's what comes out in creative play. So, and sometimes scary things can come out in play. You might, um, so I think it's really, the goal is when playing with young children to deepen the narrative. So if one character, if you've got like a, you know, a figurine that engages in a certain behavior and that looks really strange to you, if you come back in with, why did she do that? I'm now you're, you're expressing concern and you've told the child that that's somehow wrong and that's gonna drive what happens next. But if instead you take another figurine and you come over and you're like, hmm, I wonder what made her do that. You know, you're engaging in the play and then you might, you might learn a little bit more without telling the child what is correct for their level of sharing back with you. Um, but I think we're right at, we're right, Jeremiah, at the time where we agreed on, I think, to open it up for questions. And so yeah. um, with that being said, I'll step back and be quiet. <laughs> um, <laughs> and we'll see maybe what would get entered in, into the chat. And we just encourage anybody who um, wants to contribute into the narrative of the conversation or, or ask a question to go ahead. And we'll step back with that for a bit. That's great. Thank you, David. Yeah, it looks like there's one here. It's a really good question kind of based on the last few minutes. Uh, this is Tim D. Thank you for your question. It says, uh, what if when you ask the question to a teenager, and uh, my assumption is, you know, are you, are you considering taking your life, considering hurting yourself? What if uh, when you ask the question and they still don't answer, just keep repeating, I don't know. You want to you wanna lead out or would you like me? I know. Well, sure. Um, when someone says, I don't know, that is the answer. Um, it's, it's not work harder to get a different answer. The, the answer is, I don't know which means maybe. Um, it certainly doesn't mean hard yes or hard no. 
So I, I think when, when, when someone says, I don't know, especially when a teenager says, I don't know, um, that in and of itself is an invitation to continue holding the space with tone of voice. So if it sounds like, I don't know, and runs out of the room, I mean, you know, sometimes they're mad at you, they could be pissed off or something like that. Um, but it, it's that continue to express a concern um, from your genuine heart place, um, but really just continue holding the space for them to elaborate. So I think that my first response would be is, well, when you say I don't know, it makes me think that maybe it is something that has crossed your mind. And I'm just, what, what's that like? I think really just the open-ended, what was that like? The observation, what you see in that person, and then the open-ended question. If you ask the question of, you're not thinking of killing yourself, are you? You've queued up what you expect the correct answer to be. And that teenager knows what the correct answer is and what they're allowed to tell you, um, which is to deny any potential thoughts of it. Um, and if, you, if, the t if the young person says, I don't know, um, don't come up with the multiple choice response responses that you're that you're guessing might be what's going on with this child do everything you can to hold like you're intensely worried at this point as a parent or an educator um whether you're worried because you love this person or worried because you're going to have some liability if something bad happens to this person either way you have a genuine concern there um so it i think really it's hmm is this something you would like to talk about it's something that makes makes my makes my heart have a reaction because I, I want to know more. Um, I, I want to be as helpful as I can. Uh, so you're you're giving some of that disclosure. But if you're saying, well, we have to stop that, or oof, that's not what I want to hear, you're shutting down that person. Completely aligned with you, David. I think the only thing that I would add on that is at the end of that conversation, if it still feels very open-ended, just the reassurance. Well, I, I will always be here um, for you um, to talk, you know, if you if you want to share a little bit more at some point and just you know, sharing with them. Very good. Real quick, I think we have about 90 seconds. Right, I, I got to do a quick, I got to do a quick run at that one too, um, because I, I forgot this one. It should have been one of the first things that I said was, um, if you're talking to someone who has their own cell phone, then I would say um, put it put put the number for the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline in their phone as a contact. Um, so they always have that number. Or uh, for an LGBTQ young person that they have the number for the Trevor Project in their phone, in their contacts. Um, or that they know that 741-741 is the crisis text line. So like sometimes I love you as much as I possibly can. I'm your father or I'm your teacher or whatnot. But if you wake up at two o'clock in the morning, maybe you don't feel like talking to me but maybe you'd use one of these resources to make sure that they've got them. Great, Chantel, would you mind please putting 800-872-TALK, uh, 741741 and shutterproject.org there in the chat. I'll take a quick 30 second swing at this. Jeannie, thanks for your question. Essentially asking our mental health professionals uh, really trying to advocate and, and give policy recommendations to governments and officials on how to best help our youth over this next year. I will share um, that myself, as a, along with our executive director here, Wellness Together, a part of the California Department of Education Mental Health Coalition, helping to provide policy recommendations um, to um, the state superintendent of public instruction, as well as um, the governor, and doing whatever we can to advocate and take heart. There are hundreds of bills now advocating for students and their mental health that are that are beyond Senate floor, the assembly of the house, um, but um, there is quite a bit happening. Definitely open to, to uh, having reach out to us. Better close it down before the music takes us off. Again, my name is Jeremiah, Assistant Director here at Wellness Together, and um, New Shield of California Blue Sky Liaison. David? Great, and thank you so much for um, participating in, in this. I appreciate everyone's time and uh, uh, wish all the best for a, a gleaming 2021. That's great. Thank you all. All the best to you. Bye bye.